Okay, welcome to Think Tech on, on, uh, on the internet, on thinktechhawaii.com and on Ustream. We broadcast live uh, uh, with high definition uh, video, and we also broadcast on Spreaker.com, which is internet radio. Uh, and today we're talking to a special guest, that's Al Laporta. Uh, we're talking about wind uh, in Mongolia. Uh, welcome to the show, Al. Uh, Jay, it's wonderful talking to you again, and thanks very much for having me. Yes, and, and thank you for joining us. Uh, Al was the ambassador, United States ambassador, to Mongolia from 1997 to the year 2000, and uh, he still does uh, business consultation involving Mongolia and other issues, and he lectures on the subject. And right now he's, uh, he's on the phone in Washington, D.C., so that we especially enjoy that because that, that would be, what, six hours ahead? Uh, we're broadcasting here at a little after 12, and it would be a little after 6 in Washington, right, Al? Exactly. Okay, well, I, I just, uh, just to, uh, you know, uh, to tell everybody what the, the, uh, the focal point of this, uh, or at least the, the, the piece that got it started, was, it was an article about uh, wind in Mongolia, you know, and, and it's one of the great resources of Mongolia, uh, where it comes across, am I right about this, the, the Gobi Desert? And you have enormous wind resources crossing Mongolia, which can be captured and uh, be used to generate electrical energy. Uh, so, in fact, on J June 20th, only a few days ago, uh, there's a big uh, General Electric, uh, uh, rather, what is it? Yes, it's General Electric, and the, specifically the company is called Clean Energy, a subsidiary of Newcomb Group, using equipment supplied by General Electric. Uh, opened a wind power project in Mongolia. So I wanted to discuss that with you, Al, uh, you know, how that happened, what it means, uh, what it tells us about Mongolia. Well, I think, first of all, the, the Salkit, as it's called, uh, as it's named, uh, wind farm, uh, I think is a very exciting development, not only for Mongolia, but also to really project the possible or potential use of wind power in Northeast Asia as a whole. While the Chinese have established wind farms in their part of the Gobi Desert and elsewhere in China, I think the fact that the technology now is beginning to branch out and there are a number of projects uh, uh, additional to the Salkit wind farm that are being looked at for Mongolia. And I would submit that this also has significant potential uh, for uh, Russian Siberia as well as Korea and, and uh, northern Japan. Well, the thing about wind is, you know, it's really a very attractive renewable, especially in that part of the world where there is so much wind and apparently it blows at a fairly consistent rate. And it's like all around the periphery of, of Asia there, uh, uh, or the, the Asian countries. Uh, and this particular uh, wind farm is 50 megawatts, uh, and it's the first one, I guess, uh, in Mongolia. So we're only starting up. Um, and if this takes, takes root, so to speak, it could be a, a huge source of renewable energy for all of Asia, don't you think? Uh, absolutely. And I think the, the foundation, and I'd like to give the United States government so, uh, some credit for the foundation for this wind farm and, and for other uh, developments uh, of wind power in, in Mongolia. Uh, the United States uh, National Science Foundation began a series, of, a multi-year series of wind studies uh, beginning in the mid-1990s. And these went on for about four or five years. And it was the development of those wind maps, as they call them, you know, that really enabled um, the this project, this private power project, uh, to literally take off. Well, I think it's I think it's great that General Electric is involved. I mean, it, it speaks uh, it speaks to the American manufacturing establishment. It means we still have some manufacturing going on. Uh, they liked our, our you know our turbines well enough to buy them. Uh, I'm sure these are million dollars a piece at least, maybe more. Uh, and so we, we, the General Electric, has a foothold now in, in what could be a peripheral, you know, a peripheral uh, ring of wind, wind, wind farms around this area. Uh, it means we, we, have a, we have a place. They didn't, they didn't buy the Chinese ones, is what I'm saying. <laughs> 
Yes. Well, the the irony, perhaps, though, uh, is that the GE turbines were actually manufactured in China. Oh, no. <laughs> it all comes back to China. <laughs> uh, I, I hate, I hate to, to uh, poke at that balloon. Yeah, but, yeah, sorry about uh, that. Well, Actually, uh, General Electric, uh, my understanding is, has most of their large turbines uh, manufactured in China. Uh, but it's uh, GE technology, uh, it's GE know-how. Uh, they're the ones that installed, uh, put up the wind farm, uh, the, the uh, uh, 15, uh, 19 towers, rather, uh, and installed the equipment. So, yes, it is, it is good for U.S. business, and I know General Electric is very committed to this project. I might add uh, that 51% uh, of the project is owned by Newcom, uh, which is a private uh, holding company in Mongolia. 14% uh, of the equity is owned by the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, which does a lot of lending in innovative technologies and environmentally friendly technologies. 14% also is owned by FMO. Uh, a Dutch bank uh, that specializes in financing new technologies, and 21% of the project is owned by General Electric. So uh, the super tur turbines, uh, very strong ones are needed, um, I think uh, also are able to hopefully withstand the winter cold and operate in not an entirely friendly environment. In this respect, it's somewhat different than the environment in in Europe, where you see many wind towers, for example, in Germany, uh, but they don't have to be uh, adapted for the harsh climate that Mongolia has. What, what is the harsh climate, Al? I mean, is it is it cold? Is it very windy? Windy to the point of doing damage to the turbines? Uh, what what is harsh about it? Well, uh, cold, uh, cold, and very strong winds. Uh, the temperatures during the winter out in the countryside in Mongolia can get down well past the point of uh, about 40 degrees uh, 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 centigrade, and that's at the point where Fahrenheit and centigrade kind of uh, uh, cross each other. Uh, so it, it's a terribly cold environment uh, during the winter. The other, and the winter lasts from basically September until May. So you're talking about a very long, sustained cold weather. Uh, the other part is that the out in the steppes, uh, the winds are very strong. And so I know a lot of effort went into engineering the turbines so that their pedestals uh, and the blades uh, themselves and the housing of uh, the turbines uh, could withstand uh, kind of ultra-high winds. How about the uh, you know the equipment the you know the the electronics, um, the the gears, the bearings, and so forth? Uh, uh, are they have do they have to be special for this uh, temperature? Well, I think that they uh, told me that at least the General Electric people told me that they had to use kind of super hardened uh, materials. In other words, so it wouldn't be made of kind of ordinary steel. That they were special alloys that could withstand. Uh, the cold temperatures. Uh, the other thing is uh, these things are 120 meters tall, so they're quite tall even compared to a lot of the European wind turbines, and each turbine weighs 125 tons, which is a lot of weight. So they're very formidable structures. Well, it's actually it's, it's very encouraging that uh, Mongolia and other countries in that area are finding are finding their, you know, their contact with wind, using wind. Um, but it, it sounds like Mongolia itself, I, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but Mongolia itself didn't put a lot of money into this, uh, that it is largely financed by uh, companies from other places. Uh, and and that's, a, that's probably a good model, uh, but it's kind of interesting that Mongolia, all Mongolia probably had to do was give it the green light and say, here's our wind boys, you know, come on in and make an investment. Well, I think that the enablement uh, that the government provided and, and that kind of support 
was also critical to getting this thing moving and getting the project really in operation pretty much uh, on time. Mm -hmm. uh, they did have some problems with the construction uh, this past winter. Because of the severe cold, they were not able to complete some of the wind turbines on time, and they needed uh, an extra couple of months in order to do that. So, uh, but I think that, uh, I think it's altogether a good sign, uh, and I think this bodes well for success. The wind farm, uh, the Salkid wind farm, uh, will uh, produce enough power for about 100,000 households, and that's about 5% of the national power generation. So it's considerable, and there's also a considerable savings in terms of natural resources. Um, annually, they will save 122,000 tons of coal, uh, and they'll also uh, uh, keep a lot of tons of CO2 uh, out of the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. but, you know, and I suppose, uh, you know, in the, the steppes, as you call it, in, in Mongolia, this brings power to people who didn't have power before, no? Uh, I think it will certainly add to the availability of power and reduce shortages, especially in the outlying areas that tend to brown out first when when there's a shortage or problems in the main generating uh, stations. Uh, also, I think that it augurs well to really kick along uh, some of the new power plants, even the coal-fired ones uh, that are, will be a lot cleaner than the existing ones, uh, and also uh, to uh, really develop at a cons uh, considerably fast pace uh, wind power generation in other areas. Uh, I think that most of the experts see that there's tremendous uh, potential for development of wind power in the rural areas. Not all of those areas are connected to either the national grid or to the western power grid. But I think that even if you develop small local power grids and use wind power uh, very much as they do in some parts of Europe uh, for local power generation, I think that there will be an overall benefit. Yeah, well, as you know, it, uh, it, 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 it raises the question of um, how the government feels about this, whether this is a long-term initiative uh, or just one project at a time. I mean, is, is the government of M Mongolia, you know, excited about this? Is there, is there something happening about renewable energy in the government of Mongolia? Well, I think uh, for Mongolia's top uh, politicians, and especially uh, President Elbig Dorj, I think this was a long-sought goal uh, in terms of developing environmentally friendly uh, sources of power, including uh, mainly wind power, but also solar power in some areas. Uh, and I think that um, this gives a lot of impetus to a lot of the things he ran on during the recent election, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes, in terms of uh, developing uh, uh, environmentally friendly uh, resources. Well, uh, you know, in the U.S. and I guess in Europe, too, uh, and maybe, who knows, maybe it's starting in other places, um, there's a certain environmental resistance to wind. Uh, you know, here in Hawaii, uh, the people in Molokai have uh, essentially made, have blocked any wind development. Uh, the people in Lanai have essentially blocked any wind development. And um, and the people on other islands, uh, you know, don't want it near them. And I just wonder, uh, you know, what the culture point is in Mongolia about that. Are the people happy to have it? Do they have resistance? Uh, is there an environmental uh, pushback? I I think that in the United States and in some places in Europe, there are uh, the concerns about wind power are largely aesthetic. Uh, I know that uh, from a recent visit to Italy, there are plans uh, from for wind power development off Sicily. I think there are, are people who are just concerned that having something out there on the horizon, uh, you know, is 
kind of environmentally polluting. Uh, this is certainly true uh, among people in Massachusetts and Cape Cod, where uh, wind development has been proposed for many, many years. Also off the coast of Virginia, uh, where there are good, there is good potential for wind farms. I think it may take a decade or maybe more, but uh, I think eventually these uh, wind farms will will be built. Uh, and uh, uh, so I think that in uh, in Hawaii, I'm, as far as I'm aware, there is some kind of uh, indigenous uh, or, or just simply local Hawaiian sense sensitivity to uh, the kind of environmental features of wind power. Uh, but I think if wind power is well done, uh, people kind of get used to it. Mm -hmm. uh, it certainly has been the case in in uh, in Western Europe. Well, you know, uh, w one thing about um, uh, the wind power here uh, is that it competes with solar. In other words, uh, and at any given moment, you know, you almost feel that the people are more um, more likely to accept solar than wind. Um, because it doesn't, it doesn't uh, poke up into the sky, uh, because it is, it's, it's sort of independent, and you can do it on a on a residence by residence basis. You mentioned earlier that there was some solar in Mongolia. What role does solar play in the in the renewable mixture in Mongolia, and is it is it directly competing with wind? Well, right now the role of solar in Mongolia is a very small one. It it is used basically on an enterprise level uh, to uh, add power uh, to certain local industries. For example, uh, solar power is used to uh, heat uh, greenhouses to grow vegetables in. Uh, and or uh, they will the portable solar power is used for an individual family dwelling the the yurt or ger as it's called in Mongolia so you'll go out into the landscape and you'll see a small generator with a solar panel attached to it and that's enough power to light a couple of light bulbs and also run the family television set so it really is uh, kind of uh, solar power has gained uh, a little acceptability, uh, but as yet it's not been really attempted on a very large scale. Uh, and But I think the day for that kind of investment will be coming, certainly within the next five to ten years. That's uh, Al uh, La Laporta. Uh, this is Jay Fidel. We're on ThinkTech. Uh, we're talking Asia in review. We're talking wind in, in uh, Mongolia. I'm going to take a short break, Al. We'll be right back after this break. If you can do it, uh... great. I'm still here. <laughs> the, the, the political. Okay, we're back. We're live. We're here with ThinkTech, talking Asia in review, uh, talking wind in Mongolia, talking with uh, former Ambassador Al Laporta. Uh, he's a former ambassador to Mongolia. Uh, he also uh, does business consulting these days and lecturing. Uh, he, was con he was the ambassador between 1997 and 2000, and I think he thinks about Mongolia all the time. Am I right, Al? 
uh, almost all the time. <laughs> Okay, well, our discussion sprung from the uh, the wind farm that was just uh, just opened, I guess, in Mongolia. Uh, but but going a little further than that, uh, you know, you can't have a wind farm without political will and without uh, you know political officials that support it and approve it and so forth. So um, where where uh, does the where does wind and renewable energy where does it fit in the election that just took place? What yesterday? Uh, the elections took place on uh, June 26, uh, and uh, the election resulted in the return uh, to office of uh, President uh, uh, Sakhia Elbik-Dorj. Uh, Elbik-Dorj uh, was a candidate of the Democratic Party. Uh, he was uh, 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 prime minister for a year in the late 90s when I was in, stationed in Mongolia. Uh, then he was uh, prime minister for a while in the late 2000s, uh, and then he was elected president uh, in his own right in 2009. Uh, I just might explain that Mongolia has a two-tier election system. Uh, last year, in 2012, uh, a new parliament was elected, uh, which resulted in a slim uh, plurality for the Democratic Party, uh, and they have formed uh, a, a coalition with a small uh, splinter party of the old Communist Party uh, to form a government. So the government is now a Democratic Party-led government for the first time in over a decade. So now uh, the Democratic Party uh, controls uh, both the presidency uh, as well as uh, the government and parliament. So what does that mean? What does that mean for, uh, you know, the political constituencies involved? What does it mean for Mongolia? Well, I think that there uh, was a three-cornered uh, contest for the presidency. Uh, the opposition party, uh, the main opposition party, is the Mongolian People's Party, uh, which is uh, an evolution of the former Communist Party. Uh, and you'll recall in this re regard that really democracy really came to Mongolia in 1990, 1980, 19, I'm sorry, 1989 with the so-called Velvet uh, Revolution. Uh, came to uh, the withdrawal of the communists from the government and also the withdrawal of the Russians uh, came very peacefully during that period, and the new constitution was promulgated in 1991. Now, uh, with that history as background, the Democrats uh, held the government once uh, for four years in the 1990s, uh, but they did not do well during those years because the uh, former uh, uh, Communist Party had a very strong block in Parliament and basically blocked any legislation that the government wanted to get through. So a lot of the kind of what were called the democratic reforms, including privatization of the economy, creation of a market economy, were either stalled or were, were kind of imperfect uh, uh, during that period. Uh, today, uh, under the democratic government uh, that's been in power since 2012. I think that uh, more progress is being made, but there are still uh, significant, uh, if not great, differences among uh, the three main political parties and a handful of small parties uh, that are still part of the political landscape. You know, I, I, we did a show, uh, oh, I don't know, a few months ago about... Um, about Tibetan Buddhism and the Dalai Lama. Um, and, you know, in the course of that, there was some discussion about Mongolian Buddhism uh, and the way it was similar and maybe a little different. Uh, but where, where does Mongolian Buddhism play in the political landscape in Mongolia these days, and especially with this election? Uh, some politicians have kind of attempted to use uh, religion and uh, especially kind of taking a very nationalistic position as far as Buddhism being the natural religion of Mongolia or uh, uh, being almost a state religion. Uh, but generally, uh, that 
effort has really not been successful. Um, I think the Buddhist uh, hierarchy itself, uh, the main lamas themselves have been very careful to stay out of politics. This is quite different than what we have seen in Tibet, and it's also quite different than what, frankly, we're now seeing in a place like Burma, where uh, the Buddhist uh, 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 monks uh, and uh, the National uh, Buddhist Organization, uh, the Sangha, uh, has uh, taken a very forward and nationalistic position uh, on religious issues and, and other things uh, that affect the government. But in Mongolia, um, I think that there has been uh, care taken to keep uh, religion separate uh, from the business of government. Uh, and, uh, and this also has resulted in the growth of Western religions in Mongolia, uh, Catholicism, Roman Catholicism, as well as uh, uh, the Church of Latter-day Saints and various evangelical churches. Uh, and uh, today we see kind of a varied religious landscape. Oh, that's great. I, I wasn't aware of that, and that sounds very enlightened, given, you know, given all the, the uh, possibilities. Well, a question also, though, in Mongolia is not too far from uh, Tibet, and of course there's a big issue about China trying to, oh, I don't know, impose its culture on, on uh, Tibet, Tibetan culture. Uh, what's the relationship between China and uh, Mongolia. Mongolia is a separate country, and I don't imagine that China is able to impose that kind of influence. But what influence does it impose? Well, um, uh, in a nutshell, I think the Chinese have a hissy fit every time the Dalai Lama uh, decides that he wants to visit Mongolia. And the Mongolians are very careful, as we are here in the United States, to craft a schedule and program, you know, it, not to kind of symbolize the, the union of religion and the state. Uh, and But it is a matter of great sensitivity for the Chinese. The Mongolians, on the other hand, have really uh, remained aloof uh, as a matter of policy from a lot of the ethnic uh, and religious uh, debates in China. That doesn't mean they're not concerned or worried that some of that may spill into uh, spill over into Mongolia. But for example, uh, they have not taken a position on Muslim rights uh, issues in Xinjiang province. They've not taken uh, positions on what is a very small uh, kind of nationalistic pro-independence uh, movement in Inner Mongolia. And they've not taken a position on kind of other issues that tend to get the Chinese very excited. Mm -hmm. It's probably very wise. <laughs> uh, at the same time, uh, there is uh, a, a greater intercourse between Buddhists in Tibet uh, and, and Tibetan lamas and Mongolian uh, lamas. There is an old uh, pilgrim's trail that runs from Mongolia through western China to Tibet. And this was used by pilgrims uh, going from Mongolia to the holy sites in, in Lhasa. And there are movements with the Chinese cooperation to rehabilitate some of the temples and monuments along this uh, pilgrimage trail. Uh, so things work uh, in China even on, on multiple levels, uh, and it's not, you know, a totally uniform suppression of religion. Well, I, I'd like to take another break now, but before we take the break, I'd like to tell you what I'm interested in uh, when we come back. Uh, I'd like to know where Mongolia fits, especially in view of this election, uh, in U.S. Uh, foreign policy and, and how strategic is it and in what way. I'm sure that uh, you saw that up, up close and personal uh, when you were assigned there, but I, I wonder how it's changed and how it is changing, where it fits in the, you know, the hierarchy of um, foreign policy players in that area. So uh, we'll take a short break. That's Al Laporta. We're talking about wind and other things in Mongolia here on ThinkTech Asia in Review. We'll be right back after this break.
What's that? I think somebody, I hear noise. I hear voices. Uh, uh, you hear my chair. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll try not to exercise it. Okay, we're back. We're live. We're at Think Tank doing Asia in Review with Al Laporta, uh, former ambassador to Mongolia. We're talking about wind and other things in Mongolia, sort of getting a general update in Mongolia. And uh, we talked about the election. I think it casts a shadow. Uh, I guess the wind is important. Uh, it all sounds very progressive and uh, like it's going somewhere. But where does that play in American foreign policy? Where does that play in the region? What role does Mongolia have these days? Well, the United States has really supported the development of democracy in Mongolia since 1991, uh, bearing in mind that we only established formal diplomatic relations with Mongolia in 1987. Uh, and we have had, uh, uh, the United States has had, through USAID uh, and State Department programs, and many organizations uh, uh, from civil society, uh, a wide variety of programs to encourage civil participation in government, uh, to uh, promote good government, uh, legal reform, judicial reform, uh, and uh, generally uh, help to retool the uh, Mongolian parliament on, on a modern kind of Western model. Uh, nothing is ever perfect, but I think that the United States has, you know, welcomed the free, fair elections uh, that Mongolia has had, and certainly this last election uh, of the uh, re-election of the president on June 26 uh, certainly qualified as more than more free and more fair than many elections, and the uh, uh, election observers that were field fielded by the Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe known as the OSCE, uh, did not find any material defects in the elections. And in fact, the election machines, uh, voting machines worked uh, very well. Uh, there have been no disputes over uh, individual uh, 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 election districts and the vote counts, uh, and all that is to the good. There have some, been some allegations uh, from the opposition that the Democratic politicians uh, spread some money around or uh, uh, may have used uh, government programs to influence the electorate, but uh, that's about the extent of it, and I suspect most of that is either sour grapes or just a political ploy. <laughs> but the important thing is that President Elbert George uh, got slightly over 50 percent of the vote, 50.23 percent to be exact. Uh, the uh, opposition uh, party candidate of the uh, Mongolian People's Party, uh, Bat Erden, a member of parliament and former uh, champion wrestler, uh, got 43.28% uh, of the vote. And the third party candidate, the current minister of health, uh, Mrs. Udval, uh, uh, got 6.5% of the vote. So it was a very fair contest. and. I think that while there is some debate as to whether this is uh, a mandate for President Elbert George or not, I think the fact that he did win itself is a mandate. It certainly would be viewed that way in American electoral terms. How about, how about, the, uh, how about China? Is China happy with the result? Uh, how about the uh, countries around? China is, not necessarily <laughs> China is not necessarily thrilled, and neither is Russia, because President Elbert George uh, has been uh, very international-minded, and he's n not in terribly inclined to cut either the Russians or the Chinese any slack. Uh, and I think that, uh, uh, in fact, one of uh, President Elbert George's avowed uh, platform planks was 
to improve uh, the international recognition of Mongolia. Mongolia now has uh, an agreement for cooperation with NATO. Uh, they have joined the OSCE, which is primarily a European organization. They're taking a more active role uh, in Asian regional organizations, and they've expanded their embassies in Southeast Asia. And also, and perhaps very importantly, they have just completed a two-year term uh, as the chair of the Community of Democracies. And this is an uh, organization that was started during President uh, Clinton's time uh, in order to bring together new democracies uh, together with the United States, the United Kingdom, the European countries uh, to try to uh, strengthen democratic practice in uh, around the world and also to uh, provide for a little self-help among uh, the democracies, especially the new ones. So um, Mo uh, Mongolia just very creditably uh, finished its uh, chair uh, term uh, of the CD, as it's known. Uh, and I think that Elbert George is looking for greater recognition. He has um, advocated in his uh, election platform uh, the formation of uh, a, um, a new kind of regional structure for uh, the uh, Northeast Asia region, uh, which I personally believe is something that is uh, very much needed. Uh, and uh, he uh, uh, has talked about establishing a uh, Ulaanbaatar framework uh, for Northeast regional cooperation that would include, hypothetically, uh, China, uh, North Korea, South Korea, Japan, Mongolia, and probably Canada and the United States and Russia as well. So uh, this is uh, the kind of kind of consultative organization that I think can make a significant contribution. And the United States generally has uh, supported, you know, Mongolia's efforts to uh, ex uh, to attain uh, greater international recognition. And uh, I think. All in all, it's uh, it's a good thing. Oh, that's it's great, and you know, I mean, I, you you wonder. Well, let me put it this way: I mean, most of us don't give much thought to Mongolia. Most of us no. see, see Mongolia as, as as barren and windy and uh, uh, yurts and people wearing fur outfits and and uh, uh, reindeer and uh, what is the other thing? Or oh, camels that laugh. Remember that movie? Right, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> and you know everybody yeah. living out on the pleasant, on the, on the tundra there, and and uh, not a lot of uh, you know diplomatic overtones, not a lot of business overtones, and yet you describe Al a place that's very appealing. It's democratic, it's fair-minded, it's globally thinking. Um, why doesn't it have business recognition? Why don't Americans go and be tourists there? Why don't companies beyond GE try to? you know, establish businesses there. What, what are we missing? Well, I think there are some efforts, but it, uh, it, it takes a long time uh, to get things done in a, in a country that is, as you correctly pointed out, it's far away. Uh, it's not the most uh, uh, welcoming in terms of uh, climate, and it certainly is not as well known. But Mongolia has attracted, uh, and I believe will continue to attract, uh, significant international business. Now, how much uh, the American uh, companies will be part of the mining sector uh, is still an open question. There are several that are very interested in the mining sector. Uh, there are also uh, companies that have a lot of American participation in it that are involved in, uh, in Mongolian mining, such as uh, Rio Tinto, which is Australian-UK-owned. Uh, but has uh, a lot of American management in it. Uh, and I think that it just is simply going to take time. One of the big issues in the presidential campaign and in the parliamentary elections last year was what we would call economic nationalism. I think that there are, due to some excesses and corruption during the period when the opposition party was in power, largely 
in the decade from 2000 to 2010, um, uh, uh, there uh, were irregularities. Uh, there were uh, non-performing mining licenses. There was damage to the environment by uh, by uh, pirate mining, uh, and uh, there were a lot of uh, let's say uh, irregularities that. Uh, are only really now beginning to be uh, investigated seriously under the democratic government. Uh, the former president, uh, during uh, the uh, decade of uh, uh, 2000 to 2010, President Enkbeyer, uh was tried and convicted on corruption charges, and he's uh, currently in prison, although he's in a prison hospital because he uh, tends to go on hunger strikes all the time, and and uh, he claims that his health doesn't permit him to remain in a regular prison. But um, uh, there are issues there that I think are resolvable in terms of uh, uh, the government's ability to work with its small coalition party partner, that uh, the party that Enkbeyer founded, uh, and I think that there is a prospect uh, for the government to come together on a more balanced um, uh, economic policy, one that is uh, stronger on the environment uh, and also uh, one that will be closer to the people. Uh, and I think that, you know, all politics is local and it's no different in Mongolia. So if, uh, you know, the local people uh, are disregarded when a big mining company comes in and starts chewing up the landscape uh, or the fact that they do create a lot of mi mining uh, damage uh, or water contamination or whatever. Uh, I think those create uh, stresses, and that's what we've seen happen in Mongolia uh, during uh, the last decade. Hopefully, uh, the government uh, in this decade will be able to put those things on a better track. Mm -hmm. Well, breaking it down a little bit, say, can you give me an idea what what a what a tourist uh, kind of experience would be like uh, in Mongolia? I mean, if I'm a tourist, am I going to find uh, for example, a Shangri-La hotel there? Uh, am I going to find great restaurants? Am I going to find interesting places to visit? What's it going to be like for me? Uh, 10 to 12 years ago, I would have said uh, not likely. However, a Shangri-La hotel is due to open next year. Is that right? Uh, there there are, are several new hotels, including uh, uh, one very 26-story building uh, hotel in the best Western chain. Um, uh, and uh, located right in downtown area. There are several new, very modern uh, office buildings, and there are first-class res restaurants that you and I would be very happy to go to uh, all the time. Uh, so things are changing, and the level of sophistication of the Mongolian co economy, and they did experience in uh, five years ago uh, 17 uh, percent average annual growth. Whoa. That growth is now way down. But because of the mi heating up of the mining economy, uh, there was a vast influx of funds, a lot of job creation, uh, and now a lot of those mines are ready to come online. And that's what's important. And I think uh, despite this kind of uh, uh, political hiccups of the election season, and you know how strange things can get during the election season, even in our own country. Um, uh, you now have a, an opportunity for the democratic government to to uh, really move ahead and come up with some visionary and balanced policies. Um, uh, I think that uh, as far as the tourist side of it is concerned, uh, many people are drawn to uh, kind of Buddhism. Uh, because you can go and see uh, temples that were built in the 15th century, 16th century that still have the original frescoes on the walls. Uh, you have some uh, wonderful uh, old uh, Buddhist temples uh, and some monuments uh, around the country. Uh, you also have uh, the wide open spaces. Mm -hmm. So people who love horse trekking and uh, even uh, extreme skiing in the far west high mountains 
uh, or just simply doing the archaeological tour of the Gobi Desert uh, are, are wonderful attractions. Uh, the, uh, so there are kind of the great outdoors, if you will. There's also very good fishing uh, and, uh, and hunting if uh, under very controlled uh, conditions. Uh, not many hunt, hunting licenses are, licenses are given out, uh, and uh, uh, but there are uh, some hunting of very um, valuable animals. So uh, and there's also a lot of environmental protection there. For example, the Gobi bears, uh, the uh, which is a bear that's unique to living in the Gobi Desert. Uh, it's down now to five families of bears. Uh, there's uh, the wild jackass, uh, also uh, native to the Gobi Desert, and there's a wild camel uh, that is native to the Gobi Desert. Uh, there are uh, the wild horse population in, in Mongolia is increasing thanks to conservation, and a lot is being done for the bird population. Uh, so, uh, you know, there's uh, a lot to commend Mongolia. Uh, it certainly is kind of adventure tourism. Uh, it's not necessarily uh, necessarily for everyone, but um, there are good hotels and there are uh, increasingly uh, good uh, tourist facilities in the outlying areas. Well, th uh, thank you, Al. I mean, it does, it does sound pretty interesting for, you know, somebody who's traveled uh, to lots of popular places to try a place like Mongolia. We're going to take a short break again. Uh, this is Think Tech Asia in Review. We're talking about wind in Mongolia with Al Laporta, former U.S. ambassador to Mongolia. We'll be right back after this break. Okay, we're back. We're live. We're here on Think Tech uh, Asia in Review with Al Laporta, former U.S. ambassador to Mongolia. We're talking about wind in Mongolia. Al, I'm really enjoying this conversation. I, I, I really feel I'm getting a good education about the place. I've seen you, uh, David Day, talk about it before, but somehow it's different when I do it myself. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it is great. Always great talking to you, Jay. You're 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 always full of ideas and uh, and wonderful insights. Well, you know, I I I wanted to ask you this before the break, but but uh, I think it's a good segue now. That I recall when in studying Siberia, we did a whole spate of shows on Siberia a few years ago. That there were American uh, cattlemen uh, in Siberia at the end of the 19th century. And I wonder if that has anything to do with the horses uh, and whether there were American cattlemen also in Mongolia at that time. Uh, not cattlemen that I'm aware of, uh, but Mongolia did certainly uh, attract the fur traders, uh, traders and uh, fur traders and trappers. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was around the uh, late 19th century, early 20th century, uh, a very a uh, large uh, uh, trade in uh, precious uh, furs, uh, mink uh, and and other uh, animals, uh, and so Mongolia was very and the Russians were very big in the fur trade. Uh, later in the 1920s, you had 
one of the world's great adventurers, in fact, one of the models for Indiana Jones, uh, Roy Chapman Andrews, mm -hmm. uh, who uh, led uh, three expeditions to the Gobi Desert, uh, and among other things, uh, found the first dinosaur eggs uh, uh, and in fossil form uh, in the Gobi, and really is he is the father of of modern uh, archaeology in Mongolia. Oh, wow. So uh, there's uh, there's some history behind it. Uh, in later years, um, uh, the uh, 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 vice president uh, uh, under uh, Franklin Roosevelt, um, uh, Henry, uh, help me with the name. Um, Oh yes, uh, yes. Okay, I, I'm sorry, I can't, but I know you're talking one of the, about. It doesn't leap out at me, but uh, yeah. one of uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt's uh, vice presidents yes. went to Mongolia in 1947, uh, right, right after the end of the war. Uh, later on, Owen Lattimore, uh, a famous Chinese and Mongol scholar, uh, spent a lot of time in Mongolia, uh, writing uh, things for National Geographic and uh, uh, and other publications. In fact, I think National Ge Geographic has the largest store of period articles on Mongolia. So there's um, a lot of deep history there, and uh, our recent ambassador, Ambassador Jonathan Adelton, just published a very thin and well-packed volume on uh, the U.S.-Mongolian diplomatic relations since uh, 1987, and a lot about uh, earlier diplomatic history. So there is, there are things going on. You must be uh, in that and, book, eh? You must be, you must have uh, significant references to your time in that book, eh? Uh, well, I, I was accused of making a few contributions, yes. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll, I'll take the blame for that. But I think that. Um, the future of Mongolia, I think, is uh, very much bound up uh, in Mon Mongolia's future as a democracy. And this is why the recent uh, election, as well as the parliamentary election a year ago, are, are terribly important, because it keeps Mongolia on a, a moderate and democratic uh, track. And I think that Mongolians, generally speaking, are very inventive. They're also very individualistic, which makes it very difficult to get a consensus among <laughs> Mongolians uh, uh, in, in government especially. Uh, but I think that it is important, and when you come down to the issues that, that you mentioned, I think it is, it is really important that Mongolia really do a job on the anti-corruption elements because it's in a small society with a, a population of under three million people. Everyone knows everybody else's business, uh, and it's important to really uh, restore, maintain the trust of the people in terms of supporting a democratic government. And the critical element is that is in handling the challenge of, of corruption, well, and I think it is a manageable one. Uh, I also think that Mongolia has to develop uh, kind of a visionary uh, 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 way forward for uh, the private and public investment. And I think the model that we talked about in the wind farm is as applicable because there is local capital available. There is local bank capital available. So you can have a majority-owned Mongolian uh, corporation with a lot of foreign participation and support, and it's a win-win for everybody. Uh, uh, for example, such as General Electric and supplying the wind turbines and building the uh, wind farm. Mm -hmm. So I think you have models like that. Uh, and I think in the investment context, it's also important that the Mongolians tackle the non-mining sector as well. So uh, concentrating on I I building new infrastructure. Um, uh, expanding the water supply, building facilities for new communities around the capital and around a couple of other cities, uh, establishing a basis for new development of industrial zones in the Gobi Desert and other parts of the country. Those things are terribly important and I think deserve a lot of emphasis. And that is going to, what's going to lock Mongolia in as a middle-income country. And lastly, I think that uh, the 
Mongolia can can really be helpful to uh, the nations of the region, especially uh, in terms of playing a moderating role. Uh, I think that uh, to the extent they may uh, agree with the current U.S. emphasis on the rebalance toward Asia, um, to the extent which uh, they can play a role in uh, regional organizations and also promote Northeast Asia regionalism, I think that from the U.S. policy objectives, I think those things are all to the good. Well, you know, uh, we it sounds pretty positive, but I always like to ask people what what the risks and challenges are. And from, from what you, you say, I would surmise that, A, there's always the possibility of not being able to you know, dampen corruption uh, so that it rears its head going forward. And the other thing that I get out of it is that, uh, uh, you know, it's a, it's a problem getting consensus, and, and so maybe you devolve into a sort of a fragmented political will. But what, what do you see? Uh, I, I shouldn't answer my question. I should let you answer my question. What do you see as the challenges that Elbig's Dorge is going to have going forward? I think the points you mentioned are very, very apt, and I think that a lot of that is going to de uh, depend on the effectiveness of the democratic government moving forward. I think that there are questions about whether uh, there should be a change in prime ministers. Uh, the current democratic uh, prime minister uh, is not known as somebody who's, uh, you, you know, warm and friendly and has a lot of contact with people and. Uh, so forth. Uh, he's not managed the um, coalition and the cabinet very well. Uh, so there's an opportunity for a change there. I think that there are also uh, ways that I think the president himself uh, has to get out and lead. Uh, he's uh, now in his starting on his second term. He doesn't have any more terms as president mm -hmm. after this. Uh, it's two-term limited, like it is in the United States. And so now he has an opportunity to uh, really um, work on the issues uh, and, uh, you know, develop uh, a multifaceted approach to uh, moving Mongolia forward. Uh, we didn't, haven't talked about security relations, and I think that the uh, Mongolian armed forces have been very effective uh, and consistent contributors to uh, peacekeeping operations, uh, not only in Iraq and Afghanistan, but also in Africa and the Sudan and Liberia and other countries. Uh, and uh, they need to modernize. Uh, they need no, new transport capabilities and they need to uh, improve their infrastructure. So that's an area also for uh, kind of investment you know, in the broad sense, and there are certainly uh, convergences with uh, U.S. objectives uh, and things that we can do to help them. Well, Al, it's been great talking with you. I really have learned a lot. I'm sure our listeners have, too. It's something we should follow because definitely it's dynamic. Uh, when you see wind, you know there's other things to follow. Wind in Mongolia. Al Laporta, uh -huh. former ambassador to Mongolia. This is Think Tech on Asia in Review. Um, enjoying the discussion. Thank you so much, Al. It's been a great pleasure, Jay. Aloha. Aloha.